You're listening to Salon Frequency, a podcast for salon professionals that are revolutionizing the texture of salon culture. I am so grateful that you are listening and or watching because we are now streaming on YouTube as well. This next episode of the Salon Frequency podcast, it's going to be a great one because I am joined by a veteran, one of the master pioneers in the game of locks is here with me today and I'm so excited to speak with her and for you to hear her story because not only has she created her own way of doing things and showing up for her community, but she is also impacting the youth, which is the next generation of the industry. So I'm so excited for you to hear her story. So without further ado, Yvette, welcome to Salon Frequency. Hello. Thank you very much. I'm glad and honored to be here. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I am so grateful for your presence here with me today. Now, when I saw the name Nappy Heads and Sister Locks, wow, yeah. I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Tell me where you got the inspiration well, for you the know, name. Nappy Heads, you know what I'm saying? It's, we have uh, such a stigma when you hear Nappy Heads. You know, you think uh, about slavery. You think about poverty. Um, you think about different things that are equated, negative stigmas usually equated to nappy heads. And so I wanted to um, actually put a different spin on it. I wanted people to realize that people with um, with a kinkier textured hair is not to be feared. Um, actually, we should be revered in a lot of ways. We have created so many different things that um, help society today. Um, and so I wanted to just kind of shine a light on 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 our kinky, coily textured hair, and um, I knew that it was going to be kind of controversial. You know, people like nappy heads. You know what I'm saying? And some people right. would be offended, and some people would um, embrace it. And so I I, I I received both. You know what I'm saying? Uh, spectrums uh, when it comes to people's opinion about the name, but more so, people are excited about it. You know, they really like, well, you know, especially when you understand. It. And then the sister locks, most people think is about just the technique of sister locks. Yeah. But it was actually created for my sisters. Um, I actually have uh, probably I think I got four or five sisters. They would kill me if they knew. I didn't remember how many of them <laughs> it was. But I have a lot of sisters and um, having a lot of sisters, you have a lot of different textured hair. And um, so I wanted to incorporate them. They all have their lane in hair. Some of them do sew-ins, quick weaves, relaxers, you know, cosmetologists in their own right. Um, So I wanted them to um, experience the natural side of styling. And anytime they felt like they wanted to switch lanes, I was going to be available for them. So that's where the- You was going to be right there. I was going to be right there. Yeah. I love that. And I'm sure that the community that you're serving felt seen, like they felt like they had a space to embrace their hair and also just be themselves. Because in this industry, um, at least 20 years ago, right? Because I feel like it's a completely different view (laughs) of hair then to now. Like having that space then was even more impactful than not even say then it is now, but even more impactful in the ways in which people um, viewed themselves. So could you share a little bit about um, what the industry was like for you 20 years ago um, in your, in your, in your town? Where where are you at? Uh, Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm currently in Louisville, Kentucky. I am from Cincinnati, Ohio, actually. Um, And in Cincinnati, um, you have, it's kind of like a melting pot. You have people that migrate uh, from a lot of different areas. Um, and um, so locks were more common in Ohio and Cincinnati than they were when I transitioned to Louisville uh, 20 years ago. So I was like, whoa, I'm, yeah, it's crazy. Just It's just like an hour or two away and it's like no man's land. They're like, what is that? So when I moved <laughs> here, I had uh, blonde uh blind locks. I remember starting them. I had, I actually moved here. I had my hair was short like this and I was going to work and I was just twisting 
And they was like, why would you do that? You know what I'm saying? That is, that's not for women. It's not going to look good. Uh, but I, I kept on. And, and you know. And yeah, the haters going hate. Yeah. They, and when I got finished, they was like, oh, my goodness. They started maturing. And they was like, oh, I should have. I just wish I would have did it when you did it. But uh, it was it had such a negative stigma. It was, you know, locks were for for men and they called dreadlocks. They're not considered just locks. Uh, and they was, you know, dreadlocks, you know, it has a historical reference um, to the Rastafarians and, and beyond, actually, uh, where they were actually demonized um, for um, standing up for Haile Selassie um, during his uh, time that he was exiled as emperor in Ethiopia. So uh, the name dread, you know, in itself brings about, you know, this negative stigma. So when I went to hair school to receive my cosmetology license, I was doing locks in my neighborhood to make ends meet. And when I went to school, they, they didn't have that on the menu. You know what I'm saying? Like it just was, it was obsolete. They were not open to it. Yeah, right. And uh, so uh, when I started doing it, we got to the natural section in cosmetology. um, We was learning from normally we we learn we learn from my lady, which is the standard curriculum. But uh, Empire has their own book called uh, what is it called? Lord, I can't even remember right now. But Empire, they got their own book. It was Uh, a time ago. Don't worry. They got their own book. And so they have different references. And in that book, they had a section for locks, but it was very minimal. They talked about, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, stages of growth. Um, They didn't go into it. They didn't go into the techniques of it. So when it got around to it, my teacher was like, watch her. Uh, (laughs) She know what she doing. (laughs) And it just came through trial and error because I was just trying to feed my kids. I was, uh, you know, I knew I, I did hair. I've been doing hair since I was 14 years old. And anything, I wanted to learn, didn't want to get stuck on one type of hair. You know what I'm saying? Like just learning how to relax hair or color hair. I actually wanted to actually learn what hair was made of, uh, the composition, the function of it. Uh, so all of that is the reason why I became a cosmetologist. And then 20 years ago, locks was not a thing for women. Um, and then Dr. Corn- Corn- for, for a lot of people, even yeah. No, no. Dr. Cornwall came out with the sister locks, and I told people she took the dread out of locks. You know what I'm saying? She mm-hmm. gave women the flexibility um, to be able to style their hair, curl it, wear it in so many different ways. And so, uh, yeah, I remember praying, you know, on my knees, like God, did you tell me to really do locks? Because <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't many people wearing them. You know, so after right. you do or it, or people accepting them at all at that time. Yes, yes, so and, it, and then you it's an uphill battle, like being a, being a lock tissue, being a lock practitioner. It's yes, it's a lot. Yes, like just going to school. Um, my son, who uh, had locks all his life, it was challenging. I had to actually go like, look, now th- this is a religion, because they wanted me to cut my son's locks because wow. it was. To them, it was unkempt. It was not something that they were used to. And they didn't, you know, we live in a Commonwealth state of Kentucky. They don't want you running in there. It seemed like you're a rebel. You know what I'm saying? You're a little tyrant if you don't come and sit in these confined quarters that they have set for you. And so I'm like, no, you ain't cutting my son's hair. No. Right. So you had to stand up. You had to stand up. Had to stand up for your son and keep his locks in. And so, what was it like being um, or establishing a natural hair salon in your state at the time? Like, did you face challenges, or was it was just like I just wanted to do hair and I just opened up? And um, I really didn't face too many challenges um, here because Kentucky was one of the states that actually rule one of the first states to rule that you didn't have to have a cosmetology license um in order to operate on natural hair so that was a good thing for me um but i was already a cosmetologist when he ruled that but it, it you know it was good um because i learned a whole lot about hair that i would not have if i just didn't you know if i didn't have a license um yeah. so yeah but i didn't have any a whole lot of opposition i did however 
have uh, a lot of competition once locks. <laughs> this is so crazy because most people knew me for doing locks. They don't. They didn't know I cut hair, relax hair. And, you know, they didn't. So once I switched lanes, you know, a little bit, uh, people started acting a little weird, and they wanted. They were like. I do locks. You know, these are people that had never done locks before. You know what I'm saying? Because I switched up a little bit and showed them that I was able to do various types of, of hairstyles. And I would come to work uh, and people that was waiting on me or, you know, looking for a loctician, somebody that was familiar with locks, there would be stylists, cosmetologists that would try to take my clients because... They were like, okay, well, she can't do both. You can't, you know what I'm saying? So there was a little competition. Um, but I found it funny because what took me 30, 40 minutes to an hour to get done, it took them all day because I had already all day. All day because I had yeah. practice. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, so the more you do a thing, the better you get at it. You know what I'm saying? I like I can I do locks in my sleep. And so right. uh, I mean You've been in the industry for 20 years. Yeah. yeah. 20. You are you are new to this. You were true to this. Yeah. For sure. I've been, doing, I've been doing look, my father started. He was the first actual person that I knew personally that had locks. And he had, he has grown them for over 20 plus years. Over 20 plus years. And when I first started, I used to go crazy because I used to shampoo my hair like like nobody's business. And uh he was like, You don't want them. And I was like, I do, I want them so bad. He was like, no, you know, you keep washing them out. So what I, I learned in the process uh, about cleaning my scalp, not so much as this uh, washing out my set, because you got to have a clean scalp. Uh, people are like, don't wash your locks when you first get them. That is crazy. You know, it's like not washing your hands. You know, it is skin. Truly. <laughs> so, you know what I'm saying? You have, so, to, take, you have to take care of the hair for you sure. Have to. So, so, so going crazy. Yeah, I was you and I'm and I, I'm glad you said that because a lot of people, a lot of stylist professionals that aren't well versed with locks will treat them as if they can't wash them, you can't take care of them. Like just because you have them in doesn't like locks don't need to be cleaned. Right. And in fact, they do. So I'm really glad you said that. Yes. When did yeah. your product line come into um, existence oh, with crazy. your? Yeah, this is crazy. Your, so, uh, what happened was um, in hair school, I was I started out using uh, I don't want to throw no shade on nobody's land, but I started uh, using a few lock lines, and because uh, I would go to hair shows, those that would not be I, named. Yeah, I would go I would go to different hair shows in, in, in Atlanta and different things and buy products because in certain areas locks are prevalent. You know what I'm saying? But just you know, certain cities it's not. So I would go yeah. to different hair shows and I would get product, but it would never last. Like my clients was like, my hair is unraveling. I'm like, wait a minute, this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know my work. I'm like, I'm, I'm on it. So like your hair should not be unraveling. Like, what is this? So um, what I did was um, I started, um, you know, I know about hair. So I know the composition of hair, I know the function of hair. So I started formulating different things uh, to put together uh, for the scalp, to treat the scalp, to uh, help promote growth. And so I started getting different herbs and different things and started putting stuff together and uh, came up with my own product. And uh, they started calling it crack, hair crack. It was like, I don't, I don't want, don't use yeah, yeah. nobody else's stuff. You know, and sometimes when I run out of my own stuff, I have the option to use because I'm, I'm working. So I'm like, I got to use this and they be fired up. They didn't want it. Mad, mad yeah, that they, they, they have to put it. something else in their hair. Yeah, they're like, I know. I, I don't want it. And they was like, the other stuff, it left a residue. Um, it left product residue. Uh, and, it, you know, so when I started mani manipulating and making my own formation, I realized um, I did. I know I don't want no residue. I know you don't need a whole lot of product right. to make your lock, to form a lock or to keep a lock. But you just sometimes you need some some assistance, some control. And so uh, I just formulated some light look, a light look concoction, call it Joe's concoction. Uh, the reason why I call it Joe's is because uh, when I was a child, this is crazy. My mother 
let my cousin cut all of my hair off. It, it was probably like this, but just imagine in 1980, a girl getting her hair cut off like was a no-no. I was like in this fifth, yeah. sixth grade. Um, and the reason why she did that was because she went from having a chemical relaxer uh, and then the uh, then the Jerry Curl came in, right? So mm-hmm. she's, she's friends with uh, Mr. Dudley and his family. So she threw, uh, uh, she let me get a, a Jerry Curl on top of a relaxer that wasn't completely gone. My hair, it should, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Fell just, out yeah, completely. Broke out, just broke all off. So she had my cousin cut Ooh. it all off, even, just like this. And it devastated me. I was like, God. What is what, what's the girl to do? I'm, I'm dark. Well, y'all didn't know what to do. Yeah. yeah and so in my yeah. it, when I was growing up, being dark skinned was not in. Okay, it was you had yeah. to be a little lighter tone for for men or or young boys to find you attractive. You know what I'm saying? So now I'm dark. I ain't got no hair. You know, I was like, what? And this is the worst time of my life. But it, it taught oh, me. No, it taught me. Yeah. It actually did. It taught me about hair, the texture of it, how to uh, create different styles, how coverage. Oh man, I, I'm I'm a queen of coverage. <laughs> you know, I, I learned how to cover up some some do's and don'ts. You know, because of trial and error. And uh, you know, but uh, I learned to be more comfortable in my skin when I got locks. Mm-hmm. Like I vibrated different. You know, my my understanding. I wanted to understand more. I wanted to be me. I felt good in my own skin when I started to cultivate my locks. I be, I began to cultivate, you know what I'm saying? I began to grow as I started to learn about my natural hair. Oh my gosh, I love that. And it's such a transformation like when you go natural um and don't let it be for a traumatic reason, oh, like man. something you didn't want. Like you just have to you just have to go through it. I mean, yes. it is it will open you up and it's amazing. I feel that you got to experience that for yourself at a young age. And then you became a salon professional. And you were able to walk others, guide people, guide other women through that process. When I I came out of hair school, I immediately went into owning my own salon. Like I never had a mindset that I wanted to work in somebody else's shop. I always wanted my own. So I Mm -hmm. came out and I, I, I got my own shop. And I was working with women who had been licensed for many years, but they were making very hazardous mistakes. And being the shop owner <laughs> and, and loving education, it would just cringe. It would just drive me crazy. And so I would offer, you know, like, hey, you know, I even had a, my manager was an ex-teacher. So like, we run in a tight ship. We want everybody to be on the same level. We don't want you lacking. We want to bring everybody to the same level. Um, and so they were making mistakes. They was having clients come in and shampoo their own hair. They was applying. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. They was putting color in at the shampoo bowl. Oh, I, I was cringing. I was like, oh, no, no, we can't do this. Now, these are professionals. What? And what year was this? Do you can you recall? This is like, like when about this time. 12, 2013. What? Yes, they were having their set having their clients. And so like when I was on vacation, other stylists would be sending me pictures like, look what she's doing. And this and that. They would be smoking in the shop. It was just, it was wild. It was wild. And was these wild. are these are trained stylists. Like these trained are stylists that I'm coming out stylist. of yes. school. And 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 when I realized that they were the cause of their clients losing their hair. We as women, look, we love our hair. Even the Bible says a woman's hair is our glory. You know, we love our hair. But these these stylists were causing uh, women to go bald from chemicals, coloring. Just it was just it was crazy. And I was like, look, we you can't work in my shop because when when people talk about you, they don't they're not gonna be like that stylist. They're gonna say nappy heads. I went over there yeah. and uh, nappy heads cost me my hair, you know? Yeah. So I'm really big on education. I'm really big on product knowledge. I'm really big on safety precautions, uh, cleanliness, 
next to godliness. You okay? You got to be clean. You have to because the spread of infection. Um, so I, my education is something that I transfer to each client. You know what I'm saying? Every time they sat in my chair, they was learning something. And they was getting intrigued. They were like, I want to learn more. Are you going to teach a class? And I was like, you know what? I never really thought about teaching a class individually, like one-on-one or nothing like that. Uh, you know, it was just, I just like to give the information. Because I want my yeah, clients, chair. Yeah. yeah, I want my clients to be able to maintain their hair when they're not with me. Yes. Because yes. Do not, I, I do not want the client relying on me. No, because what happens is if they don't, have the essential skills or just some kind of know-how on how to have basic understanding and maintenance care, proper maintenance care, then when they do come back, your work is far greater. The damage probably is irreparable depending on what they've been doing without your supervision. So you want to give them the skill set to be able, I'm not afraid of losing clients. No. No. Too many people out here for me to be worried about losing clients. No, I think the clients, uh, they should become students. Your clients should become students and then they should ultimately become what you are. Mm-hmm. It's I love it's, that. There's so much freedom, uh, so much freedom. For, for us as women and for us as black women to be able to be your own boss, set your yes. own rules your own standards, your own guidelines, and to empower other women to do the same. Oh, that's freeing. That's It's so freeing. And it's, it's like you said, it's so empowering. So hearing like how you educated your clients and they were asking for classes, Mm -hmm. is that what led you to start the art and history? Yes. 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 Because Uh, tell me more about how that came to be. I want to hear about this. It was so, it's impossible to actually be able to give somebody 20 year, 20 plus years of experience in a couple hours. And as a loctician yourself, you understand that there's so much more that goes into just twisting somebody's hair. You, you have to understand mm-hmm. the texture, the type, the density. Yeah. And those things are foreign. It's jargon to people that don't do hair. They like, I just want my, I just want locks. And people will bypass all of the red flags and all of the stuff that they need to be doing to get what they want. Um, and you as a professional have a duty to inform your client, inform them, like, yay or nay, this ain't going to work. This is, is going to work. But if you don't know, you can't tell your client they don't, you know, what's right or wrong because you don't know. And so I had uh, started, they was like, you should write a book. And I said, okay, I'm going to get some little tips, a little tools uh, on how, on some how to's. I promise you the, the how to it went from just a few pointers to like I can't just tell them that to I because if I tell them that then they need to know this into uh, over fifty thousand words. Uh and I say like, this gotta be a textbook. And um uh, people started inquiring. I get people from all over like, do you teach this? And so I realized that I didn't just teach how to form locks. Um or the stages of locks, but I actually taught hair. I taught the trichology, the study of scalps, the scalp and disorders and diseases, the layers of hair. And um, then I went um, even even further when I got be- begin to talk about diseases and and disorders. Like, do you know <laughs> that uh, dandruff is a condition? You know, most people think dandruff. Uh, it's you're supposed to have it. No, that's that's a that's an underlying condition. That something else is going on. You're not supposed to have dandruff. Um, and so, and then that bacteria that causes it, and and why, and certain things, and and um, the stages of hair growth. Yeah, uh, like my hair is growing over here, but it ain't doing nothing over here. You know, and if you're able to relate this information, like oh, the hair grows in stages, um, the shedding processes, and all these different things. So it, I couldn't put it in one class. So it had to be something that I would be able to at least go from a six week course to a 12 month course where I can either break it down in six weeks or give it to them within a year's course. And uh, it's been great, but uh, it's been trying, but it's been great. 
um, because the great part about it is that you are able to impart some information that you didn't, that you, nobody was there to give you, that you had to actually go step by step, trial and error to get. You're able to. Over put years. It, yes, for years. Yeah. And you're able to comprise it in such a way that you can give it to somebody, like my sister, who I taught, she worked with me six years. Uh, we, she had to learn shampoo before she could shampoo. You understand? You can't just shampoo somebody's yeah. hair. You because cannot just shampoo somebody's hair. So much more to it. It's so, so much so more. Much you more. know the type of shampoo you're using, what it does, why it does. It. You know, these are the things. So it. she's been with me six plus years and she's great. Um, but you have to learn these things before you can actually operate on somebody's hair. I remember my uh, hair instructor saying, before you can mess it up, you actually need to learn how to do it first. You know, you got to learn the way to do it first before you put your own spin on it. And start and, breaking you know, rules and changing well, you start things breaking up. Rules. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I've seen that so many, uh, excuse me, so many people uh, like to cut corners. And it's okay, but you got to know what you're doing and what's going to happen if you cut that corner. If you cut that corner, <laughs> what happens? What 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 could happen? And prepare yourself and your client. My daddy says, "Never be afraid of the sound of your own voice." Um, so, and use your head for more than a hat rack. So, I, I'm always vocal about Ooh. if I see something, I'm not gonna wait till you get finished you know, doing something to me or doing something to my hair before I tell you. I listen to the client because they know their hair better than you because it's theirs. You might be a professional, but they know their hair. And so the information you receive from your client plus your your knowledge coupled together makes you makes you a great stylist. Makes you a great stylist. Phenomenal one. Phenomenal yeah, one. And I mean I just stylist. I just love how you in 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 um emphasize listening yes. to your clients. Some people don't listen. No. They don't listen. So no. I love that you love that you emphasize that. And so with yeah. your um, academy, your institute, yeah. Yeah. are you teaching cosmetologists? Are you teaching um, people that are interested in hair? Like who, who is attending so it, it depends. Um, I do have uh, cosmetologists that are that that um, want to learn because I, I tell them locks is that's that's the new uh, lace front, <laughs> you know, for the hair industry. You know, it, it has it has taken over uh, because we have a genre of styles of locks, and people want them all ethnic backgrounds, all ages. They want them, and. Uh, you know how they would run around selling. Everybody was selling bundles. Everybody had the, the you know, they had the, the 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 Remy hair, the Peruvian hair. They got bundles here, bundles there. That's the lock world now. Now they selling lock bundles. They selling lock bundles. I'm telling you, this is the new hair. This is it right here. And so, having you have to be able to find your lane. Even though you're doing it, you got to be able to set yourself apart from everybody else that's doing it. And so once I start seeing it was springing up because everybody says this is lucrative. And you know what I'm saying? I had it to think about making, okay? it's very lucrative. So I had to think about what set me apart, not just my 20 years of experience, but what would set me apart and propel me to the next level of my of my business of my of myself of my of my own ele- uh, evolution how do i get to the next level and so educating uh talking to other cosmetologists teaching them uh cuz believe it or not you would be so surprised how many stylists came out of school with no knowledge I'm not surprised. Yeah, you but know what I'm I saying? feel like our listeners yeah, are definitely they, surprised because it is it is tr- it is tragic it's, the yes. amount of people that graduate with no, they don't have any knowledge. They do the same thing. They're usually yes. they typically do what they're comfortable with doing. Yes. Or when they were at school, they ran away from all the challenges yeah. of hair that they could yeah. do. And so then when they graduate, they're literally spending 
their first clientele practicing when they could have got all the practice in school. So I am not surprised, but I know a lot of people people are probably surprised. you know how, how many people come, they send their clients? Oh, my clients wanted to start locks. And these are people I knew, I went to school with. Oh, then y'all lock, y'all stylists. You should be able to do some proper parting and be able to determine type and texture. You should be able to look at a client's hair. I'll never send you my client for nothing. <laughs> they're not going to, no, there's no, no reason to go. But they send them. And then when they sit here, they become, they get educated. They're like, oh, I never knew that. I didn't know that that was that important. Like conditioning when it comes to locks. Most people are like, I don't use conditioning. Well, it's a it's various forms of condition. You know what I'm saying? Just like exercise. Some people ride a bike. Some people run a treadmill. You understand? Some people swim. Everybody don't do the same type of exercise because it's not needed for everybody. There's so many forms of conditioning, but yet you need to condition as you need to exercise. The hair needs it. Shampoo only cleanses. It does not condition the hair. A lot of people look for that conditioning in that shampoo because when they had to read that chapter about chemistry products, they (laughs) were like, No emotion, they don't know nothing about. Yeah, see? So you're you're teaching more licensed cosmetologists that want to become locticians, basic information. The foundation already know of hair. They, 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 yeah, you, they should already you know, know. You know what's really interesting is that I have found a lot of locticians or natural hairstylists in the industry shun cosmetology. They shun becoming a licensed cosmetologist because oftentimes the argument is I don't want to do relaxed hair. I don't want to blow out hair, but I find it, it's so disheartening that they forget the cosmetology is the study of hair. It's the study of hair. So like there are are things you can go into and avenues within hair, but this is the study. This is, this is hair. This is the fabric of what we're working with, no matter what you do with it. And even, even if you don't want to do a relaxer, you might come across somebody that has already received a chemical service. They don't understand about uh, about the polypeptide chain. They don't understand about the bonds, the sulfide bonds being broken. They don't understand about those things. But you as a stylist know that that hair can never, ever be reconstructed. It either has to be cut off. It, that relaxed hair is forever relaxed. Now, you come behind us with a nice loctician. A loctician can get you together and form you a nice lock with your relaxed hair. You know what I'm saying? Because and, we understand we hair. Understand. Hair. That is, the, that is the key right there. You are talking you, to the people, okay? I'm telling you, that's what made me want to educate. I said, look, this to me, it's not so much as just the, the YouTube people because they really just show you the art of locks. And I love it because they come up with some fancy quick, fast. This generation is on it and I am here for it. Uh, But they lack that understanding of hair. And so then they do all the manipulations and all the twisting and all of the tugging and all of those things. And then the client's hair uh, is weak at the scalp. Uh, You know, they, they semi free form. They, they do these different things and they don't understand the, damage that may come along with doing those things their way because they don't have no understanding. They don't have no knowledge. No information is out there. I tell you, I had to watch the uh, 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 people's court uh, interview one day. And this is crazy. It's the craziest thing I ever seen. Uh, A lady went to a young lady in New York to get a lock installation. Her loctician used nail glue. I can't. Now, I cannot. Are you serious? I, seriously. She used human hair and nail glue. Mm-hmm. Now, this lady to pay this lady, uh, I think she's somewhere up to like $3,000. She didn't pay for the hair and the service. Well, she burned the lady's scalp with the nail glue. She took her to court. The judge says, I wish I had a standard to judge this by, to say that this lady 
done this process wrong. And here I am typing away at the time I'm watching this show like, wow, a standard. To, to, so where somebody can look and say, okay, you don't put nail glue on nobody's hair. It's, it's, it's specifically nail glue. Uh, she burned the lady's scalp. The lady could not get her money back because there was no way for the judge to determine that the way she applied it was wrong. Now, the lady mm -hmm. wanted to be compensated because she went to another gentleman who done her hair correctly. He took her hair down and, and done it correctly. So she's out of $7,000. Because the lack That's, of standards. Uh, the lack of standards. So I know that if it's not today, coming tomorrow, somebody's going to require standards. And preparation is key. And so I took it upon myself to say, okay, well, I'm going to make sure that if it comes down to them requiring a standard, I'm in the running. Because I've been in this for 20 plus years. I'm in the running to say what is a standard or not. And so I started formulating this book and it just grew and it grew and people, the knowledge and people start coming and, you know, just grew like that. And so I was like, okay, this can't be a class. This is something else. <laughs> this is an academy. This is an institute because we're not just learning the art. We're teaching uh, like I said, scalp orders and diseases. We're teaching business perspectives. Uh, we're teaching composition of the hair. We're teaching uh, portals of entry. We're teaching uh, all all different stages, quads. We're teaching uh, disinfection. We, we, we're teaching so much that it could not be just me talking to somebody um, for a couple hours and actually giving them the full knowledge to make them a successful lactation. You know what I'm saying? So I had to expand it, but it didn't get yeah. great for me until I started working with them, them girls, Ugh. them girls between the ages of 10 and 15, man. That That's you specifically. That right? So you're, you're also, so in addition to teaching salon professionals and stylists about locks, you are also educating young girls. About locks. Yes. 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 And uh, see, did that come at the same time or you just it actually did. Like, it, it actually just, came. It, oh my, it, did. it actually came simultaneously. Uh well, my daughter, I have a daughter that's twenty four now. And um at nineteen she was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic. Rock my whole world. Rock my whole world. For many reasons. One, she's my daughter. Uh two, uh, I, I, that's my ministry. That's women, girls, uh, big and little sisters. Uh, you know, I love embracing women. So having my daughter face this situation and I couldn't help her, right? Made me feel as if I failed. I, I couldn't help any other girl because here I got my daughter, which I call a girl interrupted. Here I got my daughter <laughs> and I can't help her. I can't minister to her. It's not getting through. I can't show her the love. It's just her mind's all over the place. Uh, we, 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 we going through these different medications. And I felt as if God had abandoned me. I said, look, I, I'm, I'm, I'm working with women. I, I'm ministering with little girls. I, I'm doing everything. I said, but then you let the devil come and get my daughter. I, I, I'm done with daughters. I'm done with, I'm just done. I, 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 I went into a place of sadness. I was broken because I felt like I how am I to help anybody else in my own house, my own daughter, I can't help. And so I had got hard like that. And so I'm still in this teaching, but I haven't got to the girls yet. And then I hear my spirit, I want you to teach girls. I was like, I ain't teaching nobody's kids. You know, I was like, that, 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 I didn't hear that for real. That, I, I didn't really hear that, but it, it kept tugging at me that I needed to teach girls and not just teach girls uh, the spiritual or uh, necessarily the uh, the role of, of a woman uh, coming, you know, being a, a somebody in your community or, or, or uh, somebody that's essential, a leader in your family, but to actually give them 
the skill set that God gave me. He wanted me to impart that to other women, other young girls. And so I, I, I had went back in my back in my manual, like, OK, well, maybe 10 to 15. And I picked that age because um, I myself had been a victim of sexual abuse. Sisters, other family members had at that age have either been a victim of sexual abuse, started liking boys, started doing things they had no business doing, uh, got in relationships, got heartbroken, tried to commit. So just a bunch of madness was happening between those ages. And I okay. felt in my spirit, I felt led to reach out to those girls that I felt like that the enemy, they were like public enemy number one, like the, the enemy wants them to be uh, promiscuous. He wants them to be uh, on drugs. He wants them to uh, be uh, an early mother. Um, he wants them to be, you know, out here in the streets and feel like because they're black, because they live in the ghetto, <laughs> excuse me, because they're used to poverty and they didn't finish school or they mama this and their, and their daddy this, that they didn't have a chance. And so I knew because that's my, that was my life. That the, and my sister's lives and my brother's, that we there is a chance. And somebody just got to show you a different path. And so, man, my sister had formulated something for me, went on Facebook and started making the cast and like cast the net and told them like, we doing a, a free uh, summer program for girls between the ages of 10 and 15. And this is what we're going to do. Uh, we have, we're going to, provide mannequins, tripods. We're going to teach them the skill um, of locks and actually certify them at the end of the six weeks to become locticians, to be able to make money, uh, teach them how to open up a savings account, uh, teach them, because fast money sometimes go fast. You know, you make it fast, okay. you go fast, yeah. you know. You got to also and, teach them how to keep the money too. Yeah, That's so that wasn't taught 20 years. I, nobody, I, I didn't have anybody to give me what I have today. And so I wanted to actually show them I've been working since I was 14. I wish I would have been doing this since I was 14, but I've been working, you know? And so I wanted them to understand that at 14 years old, you can actually bring in an income, but you can set yourself up and, and become a millionaire. You can invest, you can do these things. You can learn a skill set, a trade, that will actually set you in front of a camera that will set that you, you could be doing celebrity hair. You could, you could create hair styles. You could be the, uh, the owner of the salon. You don't have to actually stand behind the chair. You could own the building. Um, and I wanted to give these young women an opportunity, uh, and show them a different side of, of, of hairstyling that they may, may or may not have seen. Um, so I wanted them to understand hair, why they hair, is curly and uh, Susie's might be straight. I wanted them to understand about the type of hair uh, and, and the coils and if they're coming out flat, I wanted them to understand why it was that way. And um, I wanted them to get understanding of product knowledge. I wanted them to uh, have a fighting chance in society. Yes. I wanted, even though your daddy might be gone because of some violence or you might have experienced some type of hardship. I wanted them to know that you can actually win. And so when I got with those girls and man, when I tell you just, there's nothing like it. It's nothing like, nothing it's like, like, it. like being 10 or 15 again, that innocence. That, that pouring back into so yourself, like, right? Yeah, so much opportunity, um, hope, something, you know, when you get to a certain age, you, you actually lose, start to lose a little hope because you start seeing reality, like, you know, when you start, I ain't got no chance, but to actually see that life and know that you have a chance to actually help build that fire to keep that light going and show them how to get away from somebody that want to smother it. Mm -hmm. Oh man, I felt, I felt so rich. I felt like I owned the world. 
and the way they caught on and just the understand they wanted to learn. They wanted to learn. They they didn't just want to learn how to do locks. But that information that I was giving, they was regurgitating, they was giving it back to me. They was talking to me about sebum and the sebaceous gland and the follicle. I was like, ah, I'm in heaven. I felt like, hey, man, I felt like it was raining gold. I felt like it was raining gold because there was nobody there to help me get there. But God, but he, he, he set it up the way he set it up and he put it in my heart. To give it back to the girl. That's why I didn't try, I couldn't charge them. I said, this right here is not even my own. It got so big, like I was telling you, that we had to cut off. We had to say, look, I personally can't afford to sponsor every girl because at, during the time that I sponsored this last summer, I was homeless. I was actually living in my shop. I was living in my shop. Uh, like I said, I, I got a daughter that's paranoid, schizophrenic. Like, uh, we had to move, and my previous landlord um, had like when people would call, he he would block me from getting a place to stay because wow. my daughter she's like screaming, hollering, busting windows. Like, hey, I I've never experienced a paranoid, schizophrenic uh, living in my home either, sir. You know, like I I don't know what to do. Uh, yeah. And so we had went through that, and I said, I didn't promise these girls that I was going to do this summer program. I can't counsel because I'm homeless. I, I gotta, I gotta keep on going every day. Wow. Even like some, sometimes during that time, like my daughter would take off running down the street. I had to call the police. She's in the. I had to take her to the place where you know she stayed for three or four days. And, but I'm gonna tell you. All that was going on. It, but those children, they love me. They needed me. And that was out far outweighed my suffering. Yeah. Everything that was happening. I mean, it's so, so important. I mean, thank you, Yvette. Thank you so much. Thank no you. one has I told you, you recently. So recently, thank you. Yeah. When I tell you, I don't, I, don't, I am not sure if you've ever been to or heard of the Natural Hair Industry Convention, um, but hearing other um, master pioneers, other lacticians and braiders and natural hair stylists that have been in the game for 20, 30 years, sit on, stand on stage and tell us, charge us to give back to the girls the right. young girls that are coming after you. Right. Like, it's cute. You could do hair. You got your salon. Right. You got your chair. Right. You 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 doing all that stuff. That's cute. Right. But it doesn't really matter until you can teach a young girl. Yes. And that stuck with me. And now to hear your story and to hear like how you've empowered the youth, the girls, the reasons why you did it, but also yeah. how that's going to transform their life, like in ways I'm sure you and I can't even comprehend. What do you see the future of the art and history Institute of Locks? Like, what's the, what's the vision? My vision for the Art and History Institute of Locks is to be a global chain. Um, to educate our people, not just our people, but all people, because hair is universal. And I, I, I'm, I'm really not into uh, whether or not a, a person is culture appropriating. As long as you respect and value the culture, I ain't going to worry about you appropriating because everybody takes something from somebody. Uh, but what I see for the future of a Hill is uh, many different locations of schools where not only is locks being taught but the essence of humanity like you're you're this is this is a uh, this is turned into a university where other schools other um uh, like trades want to collaborate and connect because just because you learn locks don't mean you can't learn how to change a battery or, you know, like paint or, you know what I'm saying? Like we can do so many different things. And, and who's to know? You might create something that 
lights and locks or paint and locks. You don't know how the two may go. Yeah. But if you stifle a person, you know what I'm saying, and say you can only learn this, then you you, you know you limit them. And so I feel like the coll- collaboration. I, 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 early on, I wanted to like, oh, I wanted to put my curriculum in Empire and this, and I went and I taught at Empire, and it was very fine. I really enjoyed it. But I like the freedom of being able to educate a student on their level, to be able to offer them something personal, individual, something formulated for a person, for that individual, not just for a a generalized group of people, but everybody that I teach, I teach them according to them. I don't teach them as as just a group of people because everybody has a different skill set. Everybody learns differently. Um, and so I would like to see a hill branch off and partner with other black businesses that are in the business of uplifting and empowering black people across the world. That's what I want for us. I love that. I know. I, I see it. I can see it. Yeah. yeah that's um, what I want. I, mm, I love that vision. So if you could inspire or empower that woman or that person mm-hmm. that has that's multifaceted, that has all right. the all the different visions, all the different just interests, but they're really they have a pull to do hair mm-hmm. right now. What would you say to them? I would say uh, first things first is you always got to have put everything in perspective. You got to formulate some kind of plan. You can't just, you're not an octopus, so you can't do everything at one time. Now, I have a lot of different things that I get in works, but I only can work on one of them at a time. And so if your heart is pulling you to do hair, I, I, I think you should follow your heart because your spirit leads you in the right direction. Your spirit will tell you when to run. It, you, you automatically get your erectile pill ass start, you know, you get scared. So you're, you are your best defense. So if your heart is saying, I, I know I can paint. I know I, you know, I, I know I like to, I know I'm a nurse or a teacher, but I really love styling locks. Like I feel a passion. I feel like you should go for it. I feel like you should take your leap, go for it. And, and, and don't worry about what's behind you. Only press forward because you have to live in the now. You can't do nothing about yesterday. Tomorrow's not promised. And so if you're living in the now, that's it. Press press on now. Because you, you don't know what's going you don't know what's gonna be going on in, in 10, 20 years. See, in 10, 20 years, locks might be a thing of the past, and you've been and missed your opportunity. See, you you want it when it's when it's calling you, when it's your season, when it's your time, you have to do it. Uh, you know, seasons change. Um, you know, you know, you got winter, spring, summer, fall. So your opportunities sometimes change, like the the window, the door of opportunity. Um, we have a lot of things counting against us, especially as black women. We have age, kids, we have uh physical uh situations, um, sicknesses, we uh just money, just things. We carry a lot. I tell them, I want to put on my stilettos and take off my steel toes sometimes. But being being a black woman, uh, sometimes you have to wear them both. And, and, and that's why it seems like we unbalanced because we got on stilettos and steel toes. Like we got to be in the trenches and we got to walk, you know, the seminar. We got to go on the platform. We got to. So it's so much that we have to do. And you don't want to miss your opportunity because as you age, and there's things and life happens, sometimes that window of opportunity or the door may close. And when it opens back up, you may not be able to walk through that door when you want to. So I say go for it now. Go for it Don't now. Let that I love that advice. Yeah, go for it now. Don't uh, let it hold my, you back. Don't. No, one of my favorite do, things. Do y'all, do y'all hear? What's that? I was going to say, do you hear how that has gone for all her? Go on hey, for all her dreams, okay? I will tell you because uh, one of my favorite songs, I, I stumbled on it, um, is um, a caterpillar can fly. 
And it's a song that says, a caterpillar can fly. And I know I can fly because the wings in my mind. You know what I'm saying? Every caterpillar caterpillar goes through its stage uh, uh, of, of living on the ground. And then, and then you go through your cocooning stage. But after that, after you've gone through your dark season, after you've gone through your trial and suffering and your change and, and, and your legs fall off, your, your little legs fall off and your outer exterior fall off. And then you, you step into freedom. Now you're ready to fly. Now you're ready to soar because all of the things that you learned while you were crawling around, while you were in a place of seclusion has given you a new perspective. So now when you take off, you know exactly where you are going. Yeah, you going you know, to soar. Yeah, you going to soar. There's no limit. There's no limit to how far you can go. So transition, I love that. transition is necessary. necessary. Truly, truly, that is such great advice. And Yvette, if you could share where people could connect with you more, learn more wow. about the art and history of um, locks. Institute of the Heart, the Art and History Institute of Locks. Yes. Me. Yeah, and yeah. Um, just connect with you more. I am located. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, my personal Facebook is Yvette Miller. Uh, my business Facebook is Nappy Heads and Sister Locks on Facebook. I'm on Instagram with the same uh, tag. Um, you can email me um, at uh, Nappy Heads and Sister Locks 517 at gmail.com if you just have any questions about locks uh the maintenance of it and um which type of lock is best for you um any information that i can you know that i can help you with i am more than willing to offer yes thank yes. you so much thank i truly so much. appreciate your time and you sharing your story with us here on Salon Thank Frequency. You so much. Truly appreciate you. And if you heard anything or were inspired by anything that was shared today, make sure you head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a five star rating and review. And just drop in the review section. Like, what was your favorite part? What were you most inspired by during this conversation? And as always, make sure you follow us on Instagram at Salon Frequency and head over to salonfrequency.com to join the vibe.